one of the the biggest ways that people are consuming content and we may know a thing or two about is podcasting mm -hmm. so obviously you have music yeah. but there are plenty of creators that are in this space and are dealing with some of the same issues mm -hmm. that people dealt with in the music industry where it's you don't know how much a download is for you don't really control your cpm are you guys looking to innovate in that space as well? Yeah, so I mean, we're already working with podcasts, we're working with um, filmmakers, comedians, a lot of what you'll see Q3 and Q4 this year is gonna be what that infrastructure looks like for those creators. Uh, and you're right, you know, I think the other piece to highlight is platforms, the subscription-based platforms don't always make sense for consumers, but the one-time purchase will get people through the door, right? So the way that it would work, essentially thinking of like a podcast, fans can pay to b opt in to watch the podcast. And as you release more episodes, people can continue to buy in to that one community instead of like a monthly subscription. Uh, and then we have added on perks, right? Like where our creators are really making most of their money is on the extra access points, right? Mm -hmm. The virtual Q and A's, the eBooks, the, I mean, we've seen it all. We have, I think we did a release where fans who pay over a hundred dollars get like a FaceTime call and for that release, this artist had like 1,300 people pay this $100 for a FaceTime call, which wow. was crazy. Uh, now it was a he headache for the artist just because now they have to sit through these 1,300. They're happy that they create the group FaceTime. <laughs> but, you know, it, it gives you that idea of like how much are we people willing to spend for proximity, right? And other industries have shown us, right? Like you take the adult entertainment world, right? Like when OnlyFans came up, people were like, why would people pay for adult entertainment? It's free on the internet. And then... Now OnlyFans is what making nine, ten billion dollars a year, because people are willing to pay for, in that sense, intimacy, but with even it's people are paying for proximity. So what's the global expansion? Like, what are you looking at as far as different regions? And you know, obviously Afrobeats is going crazy right now. Technology is real big in Africa. Mm -hmm. We just came back from Ghana. Is that uh, like on your radar? Like what's, what's on your radar as far as global expansion? You know, we've been thinking about global since day one, mostly because our team right now is spread across 12 countries. So I'm originally from Mexico. My co-founder and CTO is based in Peru. Um, most of our staff right now is based across Latin America and Africa. And one of the most interesting things that we identified is there's fans around the world that will never have access to their favorite artists. Uh, so that's where we prioritize like getting these not only currencies from around the world on the platform talking to a lot of governments right like hey we want to carry your currency on our platform uh but during those conversations we found out that dsps were never going to governments and letting them know that they were operating in their ecosystem right uh, in nigeria in particular we've been working really closely with the government um mostly to incentivize the artists to use the platform in nigeria uh, but what we found is that Afrobeats made $100 million in 2023 globally for the music industry. Only 2% of that revenue ended up in Nigeria, right? And it's the same thing that we've seen with reggaeton in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic and Mexican regional music in Mexico and so on. It's any country that has a massive cultural export, the money very rarely ends up in those countries. And we have a system where we can pay artists right now in 135 countries in their native currency without them ever having to get paid in the United States, right? So we do the conversion for them on platform and they're paid in their country, allowing them to keep their money in their country. Um, for context, most artists, global artists, are getting paid in the US or the UK, uh, since most distribution companies are based there. And they get paid in the US, they get taxed 30 to 40%, and then they send it home and they get taxed 15 to 30%, mm -hmm. which shouldn't happen, right? If, you, if they made their money in Nigeria, they should be getting paid in Nigeria. Um, so that's been uh, one of the conversations that we've been having primarily with like some of these global partnerships. And all of this honestly started with Ghana. Um, our first release was with Kwesi Arthur in the continent. Um, he's a pretty big artist out of Ghana and he made $5,000 in the first 24 hours on the platform with 80% of the fans buying his album in Ghana. Now, we weren't, even, we weren't even set up in January to accept payments in Ghana. So these fans were like figuring out how to buy the album. They needed US cards and it's very complicated to buy something in the US, but it allowed us to basically build the infrastructure where now fans in Ghana can actually buy releases on even. Every major insights company reached out 
in the music industry, why are you selling music in Ghana? iTunes never launched in Ghana, right? No one's ever sold music in Ghana. Why? I mean, you think of the Western world, right? They don't, I mean, I think the honest answer is they didn't think that people had the money for it, right? I think when we think of traditionally Africa and Latin America, there is uh, this idea that there isn't any money in these communities for people to actually spend money on the internet. But you think of Nigeria, for example, there's 225 million people, 60% of the population has a smartphone, right? These are consumers that no one's necessarily even allowing to enter a marketplace. But then you think about how many creators are in that ecosystem that can benefit from selling directly to that uh, community of people. So not, I don't want to get too technical, but hopefully that, uh, that all makes that's sense. That's good information. Yeah. In, in terms of even as the infrastructure, because it feels, and maybe I read this, it feels like, there, is there a label component to or, or is that something that you guys are looking to or even give mentorship or guidance inside that space? We, so we're not, we partner with labels. I think the biggest misconception is that we don't work with labels and distribution companies, mm -hmm. but about 90% of our releases has been with distribution and companies and record labels. Um, and for us, the idea is we want to grow the pie, right? We don't want to X anyone out, especially in the ecosystem. I think that's where a lot of companies have gone to fail in this space is they say, F the label, F the distribution company. But for us, it's like, we know that artists have to grow and the best way to grow is to work with the people who are financing the industry but do it in a way where they can get their part and the artists can make their part and everyone walks away with the data to actually be able to incubate and build sustainable careers um, and that's what's allowed us to you know work with these distribution and label partners but this is now extended to us working with the dsps right we didn't want to make enemies in the space because streaming isn't going anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. I'd listen to music on Spotify and Apple Music, right? That's the way they, the same way that I watch Netflix, but I still went to go watch Dune 2, right? And paid $20, right? I could have waited till it hit a Netflix, but I really wanted to watch the film, so I went and paid $20, mm -hmm. right? No one is canceling their Spotify account when they buy an album on Even, right? They're doing it to support the artist, get it early because they want it now, and then when it hits streaming, they're going to listen to it on their preferred streaming platform. Um, and it's a new data point, right? An artist sells, take La Russell, right? He has, what, 300,000 monthly listeners on Spotify? If that was your everyday artist, you wouldn't even think twice to think that is, that's a superstar, right? But his community is so strong because he actually sells units where those 300,000 monthly listeners don't even mean anything because you know he has a community of people, which is now a new metric that didn't exist prior to this unfortunately since like the cd era but cds and streaming never really collided unfortunately 